Hi everybody, my name is David Martins. I'm the director at the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition and welcome to In the House Live, our ongoing conversation with different members of our community here in Vermont as we talk about the, ho the housing crisis that faces our state and solutions and, uh, and kind of what's going on in that sector. And today I'm very excited to welcome Justin Sursik with us as our guest and uh, well, I'll let you uh, kind of tell everybody. Justin is uh, AmeriCorps Vista, who has been working at VAHC uh, for the last year, almost exactly a year, right? Next week it'll be. Yeah, it's going to be your anniversary. And, uh, and so we're very happy to have him. We have two uh, Vistas that work with us, Justin and Grace. Um, Grace couldn't be with us tonight. but um, So I thought that we might talk tonight, Justin, a little bit about, uh, about first of all, to tell our viewers what, AmeriCorps is. Why don't we start with that? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, David. So like everyone said, like David said, rather, my name is Justin Sersik. I'm the resident engagement and outreach coordinator, AmeriCorps Vista, with the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Now, essentially what AmeriCorps does um, through this really great program called Volunteers in Service to America, or VISTA, um, takes um, recent graduates and other folks, young Americans, and pairs them up with different nonprofit organizations across the country for what's called indirect service. So essentially, um, this involves building capacity for these organizations, whether it's through new programs, fundraising, communications, et cetera, to make sure that they are more better able to serve the community. So in my case, I help do um, outreach and education for the coalition to um, spread the coalition's message and to make sure that folks are informed about what's going on at the State House of Montpelier in regards to affordable housing, what resources are available to them, and how large the affordable housing crisis is and what the problems are. And you said volunteers in service to America, so we don't pay you. That will put out that confession right, right there, yeah. right? VAHC does not pay you a salary. The coalition does not pay me salary, though the coalition does pay me a decent um, housing stipend. Um, AmeriCorps overall, the federal government, does provide um, a live-in stipend for the VISTAs, um, which varies from region to region. So for the Chittenden County region of Vermont, it's about 1500 though there's about to be a pay increase for the next group of VISTAs that come in. And that stipend is, does that stipend go directly to the landlord? Um, the, the housing stipend yeah. does, but the living um, allowance goes into the VISTA's pocket so that they can pay their expenses from rent to um, insurance to groceries as best as they can. It doesn't leave much, though, for an ice cream cone on a hot day. <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> Luckily, I'm in a good situation um, where I have a decent rent from a landlord who was a former America Vista and likes to rent out to America Vistas, but it's kind of difficult, especially when we look at um, what the fair market rent is in Vermont. Um, and what an affordable rent is supposed to be, about 30% of your monthly income mm -hmm. by HUD standards, um, housing and urban development agency. So um, with the rent that I have right now, it is affordable. But for most rentals that are available in this area, I wouldn't be able to afford them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, of course. Now, um, so you sort of, you apply for the position, it, right? It's not just something you sign up for, you have to apply for it. And so now I'll put you on the spot, because I've never asked this, but um, was it only housing that you applied to? Or was that like the only thing you wanted to do? Or did you kind of apply to different kinds of service opportunities? No, it wasn't. So I applied to um, multiple different VISTA opportunities, though I was very familiar with the coalition after having served in, in an internship over the summer a few years back with one of our partner organizations, CVOEO, the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, where I worked a lot with the mobile home park community. So definitely um, affordable housing held a place in my heart after that work, which is why I was ultimately drawn to the coalition. We, I, and I'm certainly very glad that, that you and Grace both came to, uh, to join us. I'll, we'll tell everybody uh, at home that the coalition cannot function without, <laughs> without the, the, <laughs> the vital role that you all play. So, and you're not from, you are not originally a Vermonter. Like me, you came here for VAHC. So, and you're originally from Del, uh, New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jer <laughs> so it's all the same down there when you're from the Northeast. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> from New Jersey. So you also had to do this housing hunt. I had a call just this week from, with a um, 
someone from the media who wanted to talk about um, whether it was true or not that people are turning down job opportunities here because they can't find somewhere to live. And I said, oh, absolutely, it's true. Mm -hmm. It's a real, that, that, that's not just a, um, an a anecdotal thing we say because it's uh, because of the labor story. It's a real issue, right? Yeah, it is. In fact, I do know that we had someone in my America Vista class that had secured a position here in Vermont and they're all ready to start volunteering and they could not find housing. So ultimately, they had to turn it down. Good Lord. And now you had already started. Did, did you get word about your place where you're living right away or did you have to get in the weeds of that hunt? It was a, a search in the weeds through various um, apartment rental websites and Facebook groups um, before I was able to find where I'm at right now. Wow. Good. Well, good for you. I saw a post today about in one of the uh, Facebook gr groups that deals with housing talking about um, application fees as like that the, that's one of the big scams out there. There's so many scams, fake posts, mm -hmm. and then when you get to the real things, they're so expensive. I think that's generally how you can tell if it's real or not. If it's affordable, it's fake. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so you've uh, so you came on as a um, to do resident organizing work, and um, so why don't you start by kind of telling us a bit about what is that? What does that even mean? Resident organizing. What is it? Yeah, sure. So essentially, um, as far as the coalition is involved, resident organizing involves making sure that folks know their rights, um, know what's going on in Vermont and are educated so that they can get involved, take action, contact our legislators, and ultimately try and affect and shape um, the landscape of, of affordable housing in this state. So initially, my project began with a series of in-person um, community meetings in Washington County with the idea that we would expand from county to county afterwards. Um, however, that was a little stymied in the winter thanks to the Delta and Omicron variant of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So eventually we shifted online to Zoom and because of that online landscape, we did a um, statewide approach. And we really focused on um, educating folks about different policies and pieces of legislation that the Affordable Housing Coalition was advocating for um, in Montpelier at the State House and how those bills might affect them if passed or if they don't pass. Um, just because sometimes that can be rather complicated and sometimes um, when it comes to tax credits and things like that and um, financing, um, it can be difficult to understand how that is going to immediately affect me. So that's what we did um, for, throughout the entire legislative session until May when they ended. And right now, um, as you know, we're mo we moved on to a town hall format, which is actually fairly unique as compared to the community meetings. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's spoil spoiler alert, everybody. I, I already knew how this uh, <laughs> how that story ends, obviously, because I'm his boss. But I was really struck by, in the course of us doing this work together as a as a coalition and, and you know and with you the seeing the because from our perspective and as people who are kind of doing this work regularly we think like well this is a, a wonderful opportunity right like we oh we just you know put this opportunity out there for people to gather and they can be heard and they can to me that's such a powerful i would jump at any opportunity to for my voice to be heard in the in the arena of like lawmakers right and like that um, because it's really very true that legislators, my experience has been that legislators really want to hear from, from constituents. They want to hear, especially here it seems, they really do want to hear from Vermonters of every walk of life. And I think that even now, like talking to the candidates and people who are running for, the, for office, they, it seems that they're very much aware of the weight. Yeah. The weight of the office, the responsibility, and the fact that the discussions they have in those rooms and in those chambers affect the daily life of Vermonters. And so they, they want to hear from all Vermonters. And so I was really struck by that that connection is not so obvious to everyone. That sometimes we get, it's probably true for all of us, that we get so kind of stuck in our situations that it's hard to see how what happens in Montpelier impacts our everyday lives. Yeah, definitely. And I think I can share too that Generally, there is a lot of apathy among um, folks in the community when it comes to um, getting involved and getting engaged with what happens at the state house and what happens in local government, um, just because of the pandemic, because of recent events. Um, but 
your voice does matter, especially here in Vermont, um, with our citizen legislature that is built around um, being in touch, in step with the community, being involved and in making sure that um, constituents are heard um, and that their voices are brought to the state house in the end, ultimately. Yeah, I had some folks with the omnibus housing bill this past session, you know, this big housing bill, S226, that dealt with, and they heard so much about it in the media and they, you know, and folks, I think, when I talked to some folks about the bill, they seemed sort of disappointed. Like, it wasn't as exciting as they thought it was gonna be. Yeah. <laughs> with things like, you know, permitting and Act 250, and I think that we sort of, for the average for the average person just kind of going through life, they're like, well, I, I need an apartment, and I'm paying way more than I can afford. How do we fix this? And the behind the scenes stuff, which so often is what is worked out in legislation, seems so disconnected from the solu from the tangible solution. I think that's why people turn out for things like, you know, the Roe v. Wade stuff that just happened. People turn out for that. People turned out for things like marriage equality. People turn out for those big things, mm -hmm. but those that, but things like, you know, a bill that deals with water and wastewater connection <laughs> yeah. is, is harder to get excited about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think definitely um, a lot of those larger issues are clear cut. They're still incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, housing is kind of a big mess, as you and I both know. Um, there's a lot of history behind it going back um, to the Reagan era, moving forward with how the government funded or didn't fund and then funded again um, housing, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of mechanisms to build more housing um, when lower prices and make sure that folks can be housed um, at a decent, reasonable price and have that dignity too. Mm -hmm. Now you also, I know, uh, during your time with us, got involved with uh, the VAHC's Manufactured Home Subcommittee. Um, yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that they do? Yeah, I did. So initially, um, I actually got involved with that before I joined the coalition. About two years ago, during my internship with CVOEO, as I mentioned, um, I was a community liaison intern with their mobile homes program. And one of the goals of that internship was to um, work with um, community members and stakeholders to see um, how we could develop some type of advisory committee made up of nonprofit partners, um, residents of affordable housing communities, um, to work together to advocate for um, manufactured housing, which um, is one of the largest sources of unsubsidized affordable housing um, in Vermont and the United States. Mm -hmm. So our subcommittee um, of the coalition is made up of various um, organizations, various leadership from different organizations, as well as some leadership from different cooperative mobile home parks. So manufactured home communities that are all entirely owned by the residents. and So the residents control the prices and the rents to guarantee that folks don't get unduly evicted, which can be a real problem in mobile home parks because the mobile part is a real misnomer. It costs a lot of money to lift those homes off of the land that you rent and move them. Um, and oftentimes um, these homes are so old that the foundation and the structure would just fall apart if you tried to move it to begin with. Mm -hmm. So that can be a real issue. Do we kind of lead the way in Vermont in, in a sense when it comes to the, uh, the co-ops or is that kind of uh, the cooperative model or is that kind of the going thing? So I know across New England, that's a very big thing, um, but Vermont is one of the leaders in it too, in the cooperative model. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to everything from um, supermarkets to apartments to mobile home parks. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think that it, um, I think it, I think that it builds, it, it builds community, I think, in a lot of important ways and um, such, such great important work. Yeah. You mentioned that we've switched to the town hall model for our, um, for our uh, community meetings, and this for to a little backstory for uh, those of you who are watching, we had uh, we have a big turnover in the state house this year, and there's a real uh, and you know Justin, you hear me say all the time that if someone's running for office this year and they do not include housing as one of the items on their platform, then they are not intelligent enough to run for office because it's just such an issue. If you're, if you're running for office and you're not talking about it, like, you're out of luck. But, so everybody's talking about it, and as we've already said, it's such a complicated issue that, and you know, our, 
the, legis the wonderful part of our legislator legislature is that these policymakers are everyday Vermonters who stand up and say, "I want to represent, I want to represent my community," and the uh, and just um, just like any other Vermonter may not know all the ins and outs of housing, just becoming a lawmaker doesn't magically inform you, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, so we've put together these town halls by region to invite candidates to talk to their potential constituents, our membership, that kind of a thing, um, so that they can learn about housing. How do you think they're going so far? I think, like I said before, it's been a really um, unique program and special program. So a lot of these um, town hall events that you hear about as the elections are ongoing are all about meet the candidates, meet the candidates, meet the candidates. But this event is really the candidates meeting you. Mm -hmm. So it's really a great opportunity for candidates to come instead of giving a stump speech or saying why you should it for them, for them to hear directly from our, our members, our nonprofit housing organizations and service providers, and regular everyday Vermonters um, who will be their constituents about the issues they face, the questions they have. Um, and it's a great place for candidates themselves to ask questions because, again, like you said, not everyone knows everything about housing. It's very complex, especially me when I first started. Um, it really was a boot camp to get caught up to speed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I know. I'm still in it, I think, uh, in, in the boot camp. Yeah, no, I agree. I think what's really struck me about the town halls is how, um, how eager and really humble the candidates are that are running for office. I think a lot of times when you think of, you know, well, Joe is running for... Uh, whatever, dog catch, town dog catcher, you know. We assume that there's this stereotype about politicians, right, and that there is sort of some arrogance and some, not at all the case here. It hasn't been my experience at all. The people here uh, who are running for office have been really very proactive about reaching out, about mm -hmm. asking questions and saying, I want to be educated and uh, about this issue. I want, I want to learn more. And I just think that that's I think that's fantastic and speaks to yeah. speaks to the values of Vermont, I think. Definitely, and, and it's been the same across every region and political party in Vermont, too. Mm -hmm. yep. Everyone really wants, they, they just want to know, so. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and I think the, um, it's been interesting seeing some of the, um, you know, folks can register on the website um, mm -hmm. and they register as a constituent or a member or a, or a um, candidate. And that's www.vtaffordablehousing.org slash outreach. <laughs> so sign up. <laughs> Little plug there. And right there on the website you can see what day your region is uh, is meeting on. But I'm, you know, a lot of times folks will shoot me an email, uh, uh, particularly the candidates, mm -hmm. and they'll say, oh, well, you know, I went to the website to register for my region, but I can't make it that night because I have this or I have that. But I want to know more. And so, you know, they'll schedule a time to talk to me or, they'll, or, you know, they'll send in their questions directly. Or, and I'm just really, really impressed by how seriously, um, you know, um, how just serious they are about learning about it. You know, yeah. that's really, I think, very, um, very telling. Because I think if I learned one thing in the legislature last year, it's that there's no magic bullet. There's no one solution, you mm -hmm. know. I was talking to um, a representative yesterday. We were having coffee, and we were saying, you know, this housing crisis took it took 30 years to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't keep up with housing. We didn't keep up with this. We didn't keep up with that. There's the different attempts with the government at different levels to then a pandemic. We we would be fools to think we can just stroll into Montpelier and in one biennium fix it, mm -hmm. just fix this this problem that we've been working that we've been causing for, <laughs> for yeah. decades that we can just fix it overnight. And so it's a, it's a slow and steady work. Definitely, yeah. I mean, the coalition has been around since the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. So it's been constant work um, with constant progress to get to where we are. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's a few steps forward and a few steps back. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, uh, especially after this historic year that we had at the State House with um, tremendous investments into housing, um, it's very exciting to see um, what Vermont is going to do. Mm -hmm. I always think of Gus, uh, Gus Seelig from um, VHCB, who said uh, we were talking, when I first, first took this uh, role, 
we were talking about all the investments from the year before that the legislature had put into housing, and he said, you know, my concern is that this year the legislators are going to say, well, we already invested, you know, hundreds of millions of, you know, in, into this. Why is this still an issue? Why isn't it just fixed, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, and the answer to that is that the problem is so big that hundreds of millions is an investment. It's, a, it's the down payment yeah. on, on resolving this problem. And that's really um, mind-blowing to... to, to to really think about, you know, and that even if we had all the money in the world, we, th there's all these other dynamics too that have to, it's not even a problem that can be solved with, with money. Money helps, but it's not going to be entirely solved with money. Yeah, it's definitely. It's very, um, very kind of poignant. We had, I wonder what your thoughts are about, there was uh, um, the point, not point in time, point in time? The, What's the um, report we just that just came the, out? The out of reach. Out of report. reach. I knew it was, point in time is a couple months ago. Anyway, um, the out of reach report, looking at the housing issue across the country, and I don't know about you when you read it, but when I read it, I thought, whoa, that really puts quite a sharp light on. It does, yeah. So as you know, that report is conducted every year by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, and it looks state by state, community by community, um, to look strictly at the numbers on what the affordable housing crisis looks like in every state and every community. Um, and overall, um, for Vermont, so what they do is um, they look at the fair, the fair market rent. So essentially, um, kind of an average of what rents are going for for one bedroom, two bedroom apartments um, and what they should look like, which oftentimes if you look at that and compare it to like Zillow or rent.com, um, it doesn't really match up. Um, those prices are a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. They tend to be. Um, but it also does something which is really cool, which it looks at um, wages to see um, what an affordable housing wage would be for an average Vermonter for a two bedroom apartment, for instance. So it essentially assumes that you're working 40 hours a week, right? Um, and then it takes the fair market rent, it takes your salary, and it looks to see what you can afford pay, if you pay 30% of your monthly wages, mm -hmm. which is what is considered affordable by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So in Vermont, that's about $23 an hour is the affordable housing wage. Meanwhile, um, the minimum wage in Vermont, we've taken a lot of steps compared to some other states and the federal government, but it's only $12.55. Mm -hmm. So you have to work essentially um, one and a half full-time jobs, one to two jobs, to be able to um, afford rent and then be able to adequately pay for other things like gas, a car, insurance, mm -hmm. um, healthcare, education, um, food. <laughs> and gas prices can, you know, are crazy. And the, I know, I mean, <laughs> I know I can't get out of the grocery store under a hundred dollars. I mean, there's just no way to do it. It's, and we, you know, I think that we often talk about, you know, like I'll go visit when I'm visiting with my parents, sometimes we'll talk about the cost of something, you know, and, and my dad will say, I remember when, you know, such and such only costs such and such, or, you know, yep. and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and we hear that all the time from the generations ahead of us. I've got in um, at least two phone calls from my grandma um, over the past year asking me how much I paid for groceries, <laughs> comparing that to back in her day. <laughs> and I'm sure that, like, the generation before them paid even less for all these things, you know, and like we, and I think that we, um, it's, it's easy to kind of like brush that off as like, well, every generation says that. But I think that what the Out of Reach report, which is at appropriately named, highlights is that this is a tangible, real, this is not just anecdotal, that this is absurd. I remember when um, in my bartending days, a, a lifetime ago, I, uh, I was in my very early 20s and wanted to, uh, had applied for this job that was advertised as a marketing manager. And uh, I applied for the job, I got it. Well, it turned out to be door-to-door -door sales. And you walk around, sell these coupon books, and they had this whole kind of algorithm of how to make, you know, all this money. And so I went. I remember the first couple of weeks. I like the first week. I finally went out on my own. Like, and after the whole week of hoofing it around all these neighborhoods in the middle of nowhere, Massachusetts, in the snow, and you know, I had a hundred bucks mm -hmm. was what I made. And I remember I went to the manager and I said, 
you know, I can't, um, I, I can't keep this, this role. I need, to make, I need to make more money. And he said, well, what are you paying in rent? And at the time, I was paying $400 a month. I, I think my total rent was 800 and I had one roommate. I said, well, $400 a month. And he said, well, they say if you can make, if that, in that you should make, oh, I don't remember what his math was, but the bottom line was, was that, that your rent should be a quarter of your, of your income. That was his argument. Which is quarter. less than the HUD standards. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> okay. And like now, but I look back now and think, first of all, I think, wow, I was only paying $800 a month for rent. Like, that's phenomenal. And, and just, I think part of what's frightening about all of it is how fast all these things have increased. Because in my own lifetime, and I, I mean, I'm not, I'm older than you, but I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> you know, it's shocking how fast the numbers have gone up, you know, and it, it's really disproportionate and really kind of really very alarming. Yeah. So as you come to the end of your Vista service year, it, what would, what would you say is probably the most valuable thing you've learned about housing or or the most valuable thing you're taking with you? That's a very good question. I think I can touch into some of the things we were talking about as we were talking about the town hall meetings of candidates. It's that um, really when it comes down to the state and local level, some of the party lines that you see in the divides um, at the federal level, at the national level, don't really exist and people are more willing especially when it's not all about what's on cable news or Twitter, mm -hmm. to work together on issues to improve um, the life of average everyday Vermonters. Now granted, there are going to be some disagreements, but for the most part, um, there's been a lot of collaboration at the State House, and it's been really nice to see that mm -hmm. um, as you do your work there. Mm -hmm. And also to see that through the town hall maidens of folks from either side, progressives, Democrats, Republicans, independents, really come together to acknowledge that housing is an issue that needs to be solved. And now, as your year comes to an end, what's the, the plan? Are you gonna flee Vermont for, uh, for cheaper rent somewhere else, or are you stepping out into the world? No, for some reason, world? I thought that the snow was gonna drive me away and the negative 20 degree temperatures, but <laughs> actually I'm kind of getting drawn in. So I'm definitely still on the lookout, but I'm very eagerly um, awaiting interviews that are gonna take place. Um, mm -hmm and I'm hoping to stay in Vermont, if not go elsewhere for other opportunities. And but now yeah. that you're stepping out into, I'm guessing you're starting to look at apartments and what's out there. I was just there. doing that today, yeah. Has it gotten any better since a year ago or? So definitely um, some of the salaries that I've been looking at a lot better than the AmeriCorps stipend, mm -hmm. so that's been helpful. However, the rents are also pretty high too, mm -hmm. to the point where it might be 40% of my monthly salary, so 10% above the HUD standard. Has they, so. Have they come down at all? Um, it's been pretty stagnant, I have to tell you. So I think hopefully um, um, by looking at roommates and other opportunities that come up that I'll be able to find something. Yeah, So I looked, I'll tell you, I, every once in a while like I'll go on and look not because I'm really looking for to to live anywhere different. I very much like where I am, <laughs> but um, but I'll look sometimes just to see what's out there. You know, and my lease was about to be renewed, and so I said, "Well, let me see what's out there." And I I thought, to be honest with you, I thought it was a little bit worse than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was more. Maybe it's just because I have a better eye now for the scams, but I just thought like. This is unbelievable. I'm still struck by how many they'll show a living room with this beautiful view of a city out the window, and then it'll be out of city view. What city? What skyline is that? <laughs> There's no. That's not real. Yeah. That's and concerning. it's amazing how many, uh, um, just how many scams and fake posts there are, and um, it's really, uh, it's really very alarming. But, and are you hoping to continue to stay in the housing world? Um. I would love to because affordable housing has definitely held a place in my heart, though I'm, I'm looking to expand and go wherever opportunities take me. But um, especially since affordable housing will continue to affect me for most of my young adult career, for most of my professional career, mm -hmm. um, it's a concern. So I would love to stay involved. And I think especially if you're going to live in Vermont, unless you, unless you end up rich, it's always going to be a concern. <laughs> and what, and any, do you have any thoughts about uh, the long term? Where you? with the trajectory of kind of where you're heading beyond that? Gosh, that's hard to think about right now. But I think I definitely want to um, stay with 
community engagement and outreach mm -hmm. to make sure that um, folks know the resources that are available to them, that they receive the education that's out there, and that they're able to get involved with um, local government, state government, um, and bills and legislation and policies that really affect them. Super. Well, thank you, Justin. Thank you for joining us uh, on, in the House today. Thank you for your service to BAHC. And I know I speak and for you and Grace. Grace, if you're watching at home from your <laughs> from your sick bed, know that uh, that you know wherever I know I speak for all of our members when I just say how grateful we are for for your for both of you and your work and your service and really um, just invaluable. And uh, for those of you who are watching at home, wherever you live in the state, please visit our website, register for the town hall for your region. If you, you're welcome to register for any of them, but um, it's a great opportunity to inform the folks that will be representing you in Montpelier about the struggles that Vermonters are facing right in your neighborhood. So um, by all means, register, check it out, and, um, and follow our website to keep up with all the happenings at, um, at VAHC. And with that, we'll see uh, you, or you'll see us, I should say, uh, in two months. So thank you for joining us. And Justin, thank you. Thank you, David.